Welcome everyone to a special episode of Kiwi Talks, celebrating the 20th anniversary of Metroid Prime. My guest today was the lead technical engineer on the Metroid Prime trilogy. This was a great excuse to get him back because I love the guy so much. Uh, I'd like to welcome Jack Matthews. How you doing? Hi, I'm doing great. How about you? Good, good. I feel like we're just picking up where we left off last, last time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll try to be a little less techie this time too. I noticed I was a bit. Uh, That's all right. Got in the weeds a little bit. There. That's all right. But, I th- uh, yeah, I think some people like it. Um, <laughs> so- <laughs> I was going to ask uh, when you guys were working on Metroid Prime, how often did you guys refer to Super Metroid? Oh, all the time. Like, like every day, or just we. Well, I mean, we saw ourselves as kind of a spe- a sequel to, to Super Metroid, or almost sort of between, not really a sequel, but almost like a remake, like a 3D, a 3D imagining of Super Metroid. So Super Metroid was was sort of talked about and thought about uh, quite a bit. Yeah. So was there any, I mean, I suppose from a tech standpoint, was there anything you could take from Super Metroid, even though it was converted into more of a 3D space? No, not really. Um, not 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 on a tech standpoint. On a tech standpoint, we pretty much. I mean, we started from scratch. Yeah, right? we we had built you know Retro's game engine, um, or had been building it for a while, and just started from there. Uh, I would say anything that was really taken from Super Metroid was more design and art and thoughtfulness on that end. Yeah, yeah. How far into the game? Did you start deciding on stuff whether it would be cut or not, right? Because it always comes down to time, these things, right? You're always under... Time is the enemy with game development. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So how do you decide when to cut something or how feasible it is? I mean, in Prime 1, we really didn't have time to cut much, as far as I can recall. Like, we jumped in there... Like the first, after the initial designs were done and then sort of redone, like basically when, when Metroid was kind of greenlit, there was sort of, um, there was a design that was kind of third person and a lot more action oriented. I'm sure other people have covered that, but once that kind of went away and went more to the first person type of thing, then we pretty much got straight on into development. Like we knew we would need to, on the tech side, we knew we'd need to start with a AI system. Like we didn't have one. Right. Mm. So one of the first AIs was actually the beetle in uh, Chozo ruins. Ah, Um, yeah. yeah, The beetle was the one that was actually iterated on and figured out the most because the beetle, you kind of had to solve a lot of problems. Uh, For one thing on the GameCube, we knew that, performance was going to be a concern but we didn't really have a template to go from right so that's one of the reasons that the beetles go up and down in the sand all the time was to basically make it so that we had we could control how many we had visible on the screen so if we decided that perf wasn't going to work then we could like make more of them bury themselves and you know less be visible so we were kind of building that ai to figure out how performant we could make ai Right. Um, yeah. The other thing was like, we knew that AI had to work in like patterns. We knew that, you know, a lot of the time, like for instance, the Beatles, they had their pattern and their state machine of, they would be up in the sand and then they'd be like orienting themselves, sort of trying to look at you. Then they duck back in the sand. These are all sort of very distinct states, but we also wanted to make sure that the way that they would like skitter around and kind of look at you was something that the game designers could author in the editor so the first um the first iteration and this is by the way i i didn't do much of any of this this was actually the work of uh i think steve bond was working there at the time and steve mccray and frank lafuente had all thought of these uh concepts and iterated them out the patterned ai but basically these were these were all the pieces that were sort of being decided to figure out how we were going to build our ai system and the beetle was a great test bed for it um, he was, like I said, they were the first AI and they survived pretty much as they were, uh, in the final game. Um, 
you know, things like like people had talked about some AI concepts for things like blood monkeys. A blood monkey was never implemented in code, so it was never cut. And also the blood monkey was part of the old design. It wasn't part of the new design. But things like the war wasps and all of those, those were done pretty much right after the beetle. Um, and we didn't really cut much of anything. Anything that was made, we kind of find it, found a way to stuff into the game in this game. In the other games, in Primes 2 and 3, um, that's when there, there was more cutting at that point. But for Prime 1, uh, it was what you see was kind of what you got. Like, we built as much as we can and stuffed it all in there. Right. Because wasn't the Chozo Ruins the, I suppose, like the guinea pig? That was like the area that mm -hmm. was focused on first. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chozo Ruins was was the first area built in the game. That whole um, the whole part, basically from the elevator. Actually, the elevator was kind of built last, and the room right after that. But the main half pipe room, you know, the one with the super missile in the tree trunk, and like uh, the sort of that was that, and then the tunnels going to the hive totem as far as i remember were basically the first rooms built in the game uh it's funny there's actually in one of those rooms there's a little um there's a little metal like uh uh plate on the wall that you can actually stand in front of and see samus's reflection yeah it's like a mirror everyone right yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah that was done really early and the thought was in first person you're going to want to see samus's reflection and so it's kind of one of those funny things because it's almost nowhere else in the game it's pretty much just there they never use it anywhere else because later on we figured out we could use like the super missile explosion to show her face in the visor and we didn't really need a reflection in the world but even that feature was one that honestly should have been cut because it wasn't <laughs> <laughs> very impressive or useful <laughs> but it just stayed in there because once something came in nothing really came out so with all the reflection stuff would you guys just have a whole bunch of ideas that you'd go through in terms of how you could do so much stuff with the reflection to show samus like obviously because uh, you had the missiles and bright lights and and all that jazz and i think even in prime three um when with the scan visor you know you can see samus yeah, yeah, it's either the scan or the command visor. I don't remember in Prime 3. But yeah, we were always trying to figure out ways to see Samus's face and to see Samus. Because yeah, in first person, you don't really see her that much outside of third person cinematics. And so we thought it like every almost every first person game tries to wedge a mirror in there at some point. Like mm. even Duke Nukem 3D famously had that like bathroom with the mirror scenes that you could see Duke. Like everyone wants to see their character running around. But reflections are really expensive in 3D games. And, you know, we were really trying to run at 60 on the GameCube. So like whenever we did the little Samus reflections, uh, it was only her. It wasn't like the rest of the room. Right. Uh, when we were doing them in the world. And I don't think we had world reflections after Prime 1. I think I actually took that code out uh, after Prime 1. Because bang for buck, like seeing her in the visor was really, really cool. Yeah. And you got to actually see her face and her eyes. And then in Corruption, her face changed, actually, as you got more corrupted. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that's right. In the visor. So, yeah, we tried to always get ways to see her in there. But I think once we settled on the visor piece, it didn't really matter what was in the rest of the world for it but how much does that affect frame rate when you start doing all that stuff a lot a lot yeah. um if you do a proper reflection like if you do an actual like like full-on reflection you're essentially re-rendering the world backwards like like um like that dude nukem 3d mirror i was telling you about like effectively when you do mirrors what you're really doing is you are re-rendering the world to a texture and then putting the texture on the um on there or you're doing something called a clip plane where you basically like re-render the world but then you put like you say anything past this plane in space don't render and then you render the other side of it you know the other way and so you're essentially doubling the triangle count uh to render reflections um unless you do things like i'd mentioned of like rendering samus only and then drawing her on that like metal plate. But then if you do that, you have to make sure that the art and the environment support that, that it doesn't look silly having it be only Samus. And I believe the way we did that is I like faded her off as she went farther away. So it kind of just looked more like a, a, um, 
a hazy, not it wasn't even that hazy, but just a reflection. It was blurry because I think I rendered it really low resolution. <laughs> but, <laughs> so it makes it look hazy. But it's it a would, good trick, actually. But it would it would be harder in a in a game like Metroid Prime because of the complications of the third person camera, right? Like the third person camera is extremely complicated because of mm-hmm. of all the different things that it has to do compared to a standard first person game because usually a first person game is always in f- first person whereas uh it- yeah yeah i mean when you're when you're do- well when you're in the third person camera you just don't render the reflections in that case you know uh but you know third person though does does afford you more opportunities than first person on optimization because with third person you can kind of control what's being drawn on the screen by how you allow your cameras to dolly and stuff Whereas with first person, you can put your face anywhere, so you kind of need to be able to run at 60 anywhere. Like a person, it's actually harder in first person to maintain frame rate. Yeah, that, that's what I would um, think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I know at one point the sh- the speed boost of the Shine Spark was like concept. It was like a concept, but. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, did you ever like, or did anyone in the team ever try and test like a test how to do it? Because I wouldn't I, even know how you would. I mean, the only way I could think you could possibly do it is you'd have to pan out after a certain point, like with screw attack, maybe where you go into third person. That yeah, because we were we knew that it was never going to work just in first person because it was just going to be a barfomatic if you did it in first person. You know, like literally, you would you would have to like you know. <laughs> <laughs> adjust the FOV and then people I mean it would just it would cause motion sickness vom- vomit flying uh, everywhere yeah yeah and and especially like oddly enough um the Japanese uh ha- have a re- have I-, I don't know if it's cultural or they just don't play the games as much or something but they were they got motion sickness a lot easier uh than a lot of um than a lot of us stateside and so we were actually ultra sensitive to not making them motion sick uh, as well. Um, it was really difficult. Like for instance, um, I, I'm diverging a little bit, but like the uh, the lag on the visor, you know, yep, the uh, you know, like you turn and then there'd be a slight lag. We really had to tune that quite a bit because that actually caused a ton of motion sickness if there was too much lag. Like people's brains would just break when uh, when that was when that was lagging too much. So we're really, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because basically like your brain was seeing something moving with your head in a way that it didn't expect to be moving with your view. And it would just break people's heads. I mean, like it was in, and it was certain people like I never had the problem, but we'd have other people in the studio that would just start playing and get nauseous. And so we actually had to really tune. We used to have it be a lot laggier. We had to really tune that down uh because of that yeah it's it's crazy the number of things in first person you don't think of so yeah our thought was if you did the speed booster then you'd have to sort of go into third and then go back in kind of like what we do in screw attack in um primes two and three but i think the main reticence to actually doing it no engineer did this by the way like we didn't i don't recall us actually even doing it was that uh, we already had enough of a hard time dealing with like load issues. Yeah, you know? yeah. And um, and I think it was sort of determined that like the boost ball was fast, but I think people would have expected the speed booster to be more sustained mm. and faster. You know, like with the boost ball, you kind of do a boost and then stop, and a boost and stop, and that kind of made sense. Um, but then with a with a speed booster, you'd kind of want it to be that way. But like everything about what we were doing in Prime and Prime Two was actually trying to slow the players down between rooms so you know like we uh a speed booster we we just never had a straightaway that would have been long enough to make the speed booster um relevant or useful you know i mean even these days if you were to try and make it with the hardware would you still run into the same problem because obviously you'd still have the problems with loading because you'd have a higher pixel count or you know i mean because the graphics yeah, I mean, are more you'd intense still have problems yeah. Yeah, you'd still have problems with loading. I w- I would say that like, you know, like like in Primes 2 and 3, what we did for things like screw attack and stuff like that was we made more sparse rooms, you know, like Skytown for instance. Yeah. We'd have the big areas where you could do the screw attack over, you know, the space jump slash screw attack over those uh spaces and they weren't fast, but they were vast. Jeez. 
I didn't mean to make that rhyme. Um, they were they. <laughs> Your part, they and fast, you didn't know they it. were vast. <laughs> I know. Uh, so, so those areas, for instance, I, you know, you're able to still, still imply that there's a lot of space there, but then you're not just speeding through it, you know. Or if we wanted to do speed, like in Prime in Three's Sky Town, you know, we did the uh, little grappling hook mm. uh, guys. That were then featured in Bioshock Infinite, mm. you know, where we could make you feel fast, but then do all sorts of whirly durly, you know, moving moving around in the same space and doing screws and circles and stuff. But yeah, so I would say that the speed booster would still would still have an issue. I mean, loading loading speeds are like orders of magnitude faster right now, but also yeah, there's orders of magnitude more texture density uh, in games now. Yeah. Did you, like, obviously, I know with, like, the bombs is you didn't allow to do the infinite bomb jumping because otherwise you'd end up out of the world. But I suppose mm-hmm. that, what was the case with the space jump and the screw attack? You know how you can only... Five. Yeah, yeah, but, like, was it, how did you come to the decision to be, like, this is the amount of times you'll you'll do it? Like, with the screw attack? Oh, Because um, you know how in the 2D well, games for- you could just do it for in- infinity? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that, well, yeah, I think that the the deal, well, two things with the screw attack. One, there was actually the um, uh, the late Andy O'Neill implemented that, and he did something really smart with it, where basically he made it so that as you were doing the jump, you could never end up going higher than when you started the screw attack. Yeah. So, so if you started it here, then you, you engaged it, and then you did a jump, no matter, even if you went like a little early or a little late, he always did the math to make sure you always topped out at the same oh, space right. through the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, you could like sometimes dip a little lower, but then get yourself higher, but you'd never get yourself higher than the top. But it never felt like your head was hitting a ceiling. He did it smoothly. You know, he made it so like the amount of force that it would apply just wouldn't get you up there. So. So vertically, we were kind of covered there. And I think the five number was just arrived at probably i don't remember why exactly but i would imagine it's likely because they found a place in sky town or other areas where they wanted to they had a set distance they knew how much it was and then that was deemed the longest because if you went any longer than that then we'd have to do a lot of stuff like detecting when you went too far out of the world and then drop you out you know stuff like that so i imagine they just found the longest chasm set it to that and then called it a day yeah. is likely what happened. And I suppose that would have been the same with the space jump. You wanted to, I mean, I, with Prime 1 as well, as you have no cliffs. There's no cliffs in 1 compared to 2 and 3. But Because you know how you... Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you only jump, mm-hmm. it gives you the ability to jump once. I've seen a mod... It's a double jump. Yeah, yeah. I've seen a mod where someone made it so you can just infinitely keep jumping. But then I think they've done it the same way with the screw attack where you... You kind of you still have to keep at the same level. Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, the space jump was always just a double jump. The space jump was something that I think we ended up giving later than we expected because we really wanted the player to feel like they had a lot of control in first person. Because you know, we touched on this in the prior episode of that when I spoke to you when I talked about the the jumps, you know, dipping down, yeah, and tipping at the camera, like that. yeah, yeah. And so double jump was another piece of that of basically really making the player feel like they were in control. And it was almost looked at as like an escape hatch. Like if you kind of went in a direction you didn't really like, then you could sort of use the double jump to kind of fix that. Um, And so that's where a lot of the space jump slash double jump stuff came into control. Hmm. We did speak about Andy O'Neill before, and I feel like we've covered Mark Hake Hutchinson a lot on this show. Andy O'Neill hasn't really Mm -hmm. gotten the spotlight, has he? Because he did a lot of stuff, right? He did, and let me just oh, make yeah. sure, yeah, spider wall, static lighting, particle tools, memory optimization, and obviously the screw attack and dark beam and stuff as well. But he did a lot of stuff, didn't he? Uh-huh. Yeah, he did a lot of the collision system, uh, and he he sadly passed away a few years ago. Yeah. Um, but he, he was, I mean, like, basically, we were co-tech leads on Metroid Prime 1. Like, we were both considered technical lead engineer, um, and our... 
we didn't have much overlap in what we did. Like I did a lot of the streaming stuff. I did a lot of the non-particle based graphics stuff. He did, he did a lot of things that were related to like, um, well, harder math, to be honest, uh, physics-y <laughs> things and, uh, collision and that kind of stuff. Um, he did, uh, oh, he did the ice spreader in prime one, which became, I guess, also the dark spreader in prime two. You yeah. Know, yeah. The, 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 super missile ice thing that would like, uh, that was hit such a cool collision and then sprint. I know. Cool. Effect. It was really cool. And he did so much work to make that happen. Like, and it was so cool because basically on an engineering side, it was really awesome because essentially he, he, he made it so all the collision data all those collision triangles like knew how to travel from edges to other triangles. And then that's how he actually did the ice spreading yeah. was he'd find out which triangle was hit. And then he made the data such that he could walk all the other triangles in all these directions and make the ice particles spread in all those directions. It was really cool. Um, you know, the spider ball stuff he did was, was pretty amazing. Like, like, uh, making it so that you were always feeling like you were going the direction or mostly always going the direction you wanted to go, even if your ball was kind of changing all around the way, uh, stuff like that. He did. Yeah. He did amazing stuff there. And with the particles, I mean, he was able to wrestle so much performance out of the particle systems and get us a lot more particles than we really should have been able to have on a GameCube or we, to be honest. So yeah, his, he, and I mean, and he did all the static lighting, like, like, it, like, the the um the light maps the uh the offline generation of light maps he basically wrote that tool from scratch i remember zoid and i were sort of talking to him about it at the outset and zoid and i had worked on quake quite a bit and so we sort of gave him a few primers on how quake had originally done that you know their static lighting and then he basically wrote all the static lighting stuff and visibility too. So like when you're standing in an area and you're looking around, figuring out statically what you can and can't see, like basically like if you're standing in a cave and there's something around a corner, you don't want to render that. You know, if you're rendering a wall, you don't want to render what's behind the wall. And so with, with the lighting tool, he also wrote the static visibility tool. Basically like if you're standing in a certain place in the static world, it won't render enemies or, you know, things that are necessarily behind a wall, um, that kind of thing. So he, I can't overstate how much, uh, how much he did on, on the projects. So was he like a competitive friendly rival, so to speak? Like, would you watch what he does and be like inspired by it in a way? Oh yeah. 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 I mean, it was, it's a, good way to put that actually is like competitive friendly rival um but also in, in a way where like i said we didn't have that much overlap in what we did we occasionally had some overlap um but by and large uh we we each kind of did our own thing so a few times here and there we'd step on each other's toes we we both have big personalities and big opinions sometimes so there were definitely you know especially when things got way into crunch there were sometimes just you know <laughs> yelling matches or whatever <laughs> every so often <laughs> but uh but nonetheless um yeah i i mean i'm honestly like like i'm insanely jealous of what he can do uh performance wise with things like particles and physics has always eluded me like i've never i don't step into that domain because i'm just it's something that I was never that great at and I never got into it, you know, and physics, linear algebra, all that stuff. He, it's just, it was just instant for him. It's something I, I very much admired. So what was your crunch level on prime one? I mean, I've heard the stories. Mike Wickens said he did 36 hours. Zoid said he was doing a hundred hours. Clark Wynn said that like he'd pretty much never, he'd only, he'd pretty much always there and he'd just go off for like one hour of sleep and then come back. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much what it was. We were all sort of omnipresent at the office. <laughs> oh um, my God. I mean, <laughs> there were, there were, well, I, well, by the way, you said Mike Wicked did 36 hours. I would hope he did more than that. Uh, well, 30, 36 hour days, 36 hour days, oh, and then he'd go sleep. Okay. Sorry, I need to clarify that. Yeah, 36 hour <laughs> days, and then he'd go away, and then he'd come back. Yeah. But he said he was there pretty much 24 7 towards the end. Oh, he was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, near the end, almost everyone was. Like, there was this, um, Gosh, all the crunch. I mean, the crunches kind of run together. Like 
like all of the sort of end games of the games are all very uh very um rough uh and there used to be this well there's in the it, i don't think yeah retro's not in these offices anymore but in the offices that they were in for the first three games there's this big movie theater that they built oh, in the office because i think yeah, i remember the, seeing that yeah yeah there's like pictures i mean the off it was ridiculous i mean the office was ridiculous <laughs> <laughs> ridiculous and uh and so they had this uh movie theater that was in the office but what it became is just kind of this like stinky place where everyone would wait to get bugs and we'd all go in the theater and play like smash brothers or something <laughs> else you know and it was i mean looking back i mean it may as well have just been like a holding area for a jail like <laughs> like literally people are just like waiting for people to give them bugs and just playing games all night until we can do it i mean i'm not gonna lie like granted wiccan had a family and a lot of people had families and for the people with families that's bad and i have a family now and i can't imagine doing what i did back then yeah but it was a it was a thrilling time back then um it was it was very very hard the hours were ridiculous but i (laughs) <laughs> it's like thinking of the first few months of my son's life right now. I don't remember a lot of it. <laughs> like I think my brain has just sort of blocked it out at this point. Um, I remember like just barely going home. I remember being at the office constantly. I remember playing the game constantly. And, and then afterwards, I just remember the giant everyone crashing hard yeah uh, i bet is is oh geez yeah it was yeah it was it was bad after that yeah but um, I, I don't understand how the brain can function at that level for so long like i mean particularly if you're just there 24 7 and like you're not getting much well, sleep like i'm I mean, did you just live on coffee like uh <laughs> milkshakes actually <laughs> milkshakes <laughs> Not not very healthy. Uh, well, no, I remember. Uh, and I don't. Gosh, I mean, was it the last game or not? I, again, I don't remember the credit, but I remember there there was this time where uh, Brian Walker, w- him and uh, Ryan Harris, the other producer, would go to Whataburger, which is a um, which is a Texas like burger place, and they would get the milkshakes. And I remember they were thirty two ounce milkshakes. They were these thirty two ounces. Yes, yes. And so I remember one time opening the break room freezer and the inside of the door was just filled with these monstrosities, you know, and yeah, you would get this. I mean, what what better way to stay awake than by drinking two pounds of milk at once? <laughs> <laughs> it's so stupid. But I mean, yeah, you just uh, <laughs> you would you would just be crunching crazy. And again, though, I mean, I was a lot younger than I am now and I. I'd be lying if I said for me personally that it was a traumatic experience. It was it was thrilling, it was exciting. I you know, I personally knew we were making a really great game, but I also know that like now for the people with families, it had to just be completely awful. I just I couldn't do it now. I mean, it just had to be completely awful. So, yeah, um after that it was just a hard crash. But as for like brains working and stuff like that, I mean, milkshakes look like, de- <laughs> well, yeah, but also debugging, debugging and fixing is a different thing than like hard creative work, you know, like, like your brain is actually working in a different way. Most of the time near the very end, especially you're trying to touch as little as humanly possible, um, in order to, uh, to get the game going. Like, like. Like, you don't want to do something big that breaks other stuff. So instead of trying to make, like, really cool, big, creative changes, you're trying to spot fix little things and do it in ways that don't hurt other things. That's a different gear and a different way of being. And honestly, a lot of the time doesn't require huge amounts of thought. The the times that require huge amounts of thought, like, my worst, my personal, like, well, uh, I'm going to fess up to a bad bug in a few minutes, but okay. like my personal worst one was, uh, was there was a bug in the pause screen where every 15 minutes Samus would glitch out for one frame. And I basically had to run the game for 15 minutes to see it. And 
it took a while of thinking and it was a one line code fix. And it was because there was a counter that it was a 16 bit counter and it would turn over at 65536, which is the maximum value for that. And it would turn over to zero and then the glitch would happen because I didn't expect it. So I was doing like a greater than check <laughs> and 65,000 frames at 60 FPS is 15 minutes. So that's why it would happen every 15 minutes. And ah. it was like, but that's a different gear than day to day. That's like a different kind of thinking. And it's also kind of like a very focused one bug at a time triage kind of thought. So mm. when you're at the very end and crunch, you're asking how your brain operates. You don't often need to use your brain that much right. when you're spot fixing bugs. Or if you do need to use your brain, you really need to just kind of sit alone, throw on headphones and focus for two hours and have a milkshake or some caffeine and then just try to plow through the problem. Um, but yeah, but I, I'm going to fess up to, so there is this, uh, sort of famous bug called the elevator glitch in prime one. Uh, this was something on the first pressing where when you would arrive, go in the el the first elevator at Chozo ruins, the game would go bang and freeze and you'd have to reboot your GameCube. Uh, that was my bug <laughs> and I hate it. And the worst thing about it was I was able to reproduce it before we shipped the game, but I was one of the only ones that could do it. And so I was doing that. And then the testers at Nintendo were like, yes, we've seen this before, but it's like a, a 1% incidence rate. It barely happens. Meanwhile, I was able to have it happen pretty often. And so it got written off as a bug that was likely because I was testing on a test unit with a hard drive and the Nintendo testers were testing with discs. So the thought was that it was a loading bug that was going to be really low incidence on retail copies of the game. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah, I see. Because the hard drive loading loads a lot faster. It, lo it loads different. In fact, we had all these like um, near the end of the game near the end of production, we realized that the attract movies were playing really glitchy on the disc based builds. And we never saw it because we were playing on hard drives. So suddenly we had to like fix movie playback for disc based. Builds. So this is a real thing. This isn't like a, a theoretical, like these kinds of things happen either way. I was like, I, I sort of accepted it, but I didn't, I was like, this feels different than what they're talking about. You know, like it just always nagged at me. Well, Cut to, I get my copy of the game, real copy. I put it in my GameCube. I play it, beat the Parasite Queen in the intro level, get to Chozo Ruins, and I get in that elevator, bang, first time. <laughs> I, I could have, I, I was almost ready to cry. I was like, I broke Super Metroid. Like, I broke my favorite game's successor. It was awful. And I felt terrible about it. People were talking about it online. Some people were hitting it. Nintendo was, like, sending them replacement discs, but that wasn't going to do anything. Really, it just turned out how you happen to traverse the thing could cause it. And it was my bug. And it was... And the reason... And it took, it took months to figure out why it happened. So the weird part is, after... After all of that, we did a couple of extra pressings. Like typically Nintendo finds a couple of spot fixes and then, you know, we'll actually issue like a new copy of the game to fix specific little bugs. So there is actually a few versions of Metroid Prime 1 floating out there. And also there's a uh, European and Japanese versions, which we did after the US version. Right. And none of these, these problems didn't show up in any of those. And so it was vexing. It's like, wait, this bug happened, but it doesn't. And we don't know why. And finally, months later, I was working with the original game data and was working on some loading things, and I figured it out. It was that when we were trying to spot fix stuff in the game, we would like only re-export the world files for like the worlds we were fixing. So let's say we had a full game build, and then we found a bug in Chozo Ruins mm. to not to minimize the effect of other data breaking we would only export chozo ruins world file you know the pack file the pack the package file for that world but then keep all the other ones there 
That's what happened. Well, each pack file, think of it like a big zip file, right? It's got a bunch of files in it, you know, textures, models, whatever. Mm. Um, each world file is like a big zip file. Well, each world file also has everything it needs for the world, including duplicated assets. So if you have like a Samus model, cinematic model in one world and a Samus cinematic model in the other world, it's in both of those files. Like there's a copy of it there. There's a copy of it there. It's duplicated in the worlds. Well, in an elevator, you're going between worlds. And what I discovered was that it had the same file, different file sizes because something slightly changed between it. And when you're on one side of the elevator, it got that file size, allocated a buffer for it on the other side, loaded into it, too much data, bang, crash. Something as simple as that. Wow. Yeah. Something where we were trying to be safe. We were trying to say, oh, let's only export the worlds that we need. But then in doing that, <laughs> created this <laughs> elevator glitch which has haunted my nightmares for the past 20 years. Mm. So uh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Stuff like that. Interesting story. <laughs> <sighs> it was terrifying. It was one of the worst moments I've ever had in professional game development was when it made that sound and then just froze. I just was, oh, was, and my, my wife, my now wife, of course, laughed at me when that happened and ran, walked out of the room. I was like, oh, oof. <laughs> did you so, uh did you challenge Mark Pacini on the Metroids themselves? Like did you want them what, to be in uh, what regard? And and like you wanted them to be more dangerous or they take off more health. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he just largely ignored me on that, which was <laughs> right, but oh my gosh. Well, I it always really bugged me because our game is called Metroid, you know, and the Metroids in all of our games are basically easily killable enemies you know yeah like they don't pose much of a threat of a threat yeah yeah and so that 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 bugged me i mean they were pretty threatening in the first game but i think that they still had it where like you could kill them with power bombs or something um you know so yeah i just thought it was like I, at least in the first game the last creature is the met you know the metroid prime and then the others, it just what you know, they weren't there. But I, I almost wanted like all or nothing. Like either the Metroids are really hard, or they're not really in the game. You know, um, but I challenged him on it. He just, he just ignored me, which was totally fine. I and it was the right move. I mean, it, it didn't matter. It just always was something that bugged me a little bit. I mean, I always love that cinema in Metroid Prime when you first see the first Metroid. Yeah. After you have the ice beam, you know, when it comes out, and you know, you have to freeze it and take it out. And I really dug that. Um. But yeah, I just was, I always found that to be a, a lost opportunity. Well, I, the Metroids are always used, I feel, to good effect in creating, I suppose, more tension-based scenes or horror-based scenes. Like, like, especially in Prime 3, now that I think about it, there's that bit in Skytown where you go through the, the Xeno research area, good reference to aliens, by the way, um, where you take you you take out the energy cell and then all the power goes off and then all the metroids get set free yeah yeah that was that was really cool yeah i dug that i think it was like prime two where they were a bit of a waste because i think like i think that there was like a part in the dark world when they were there and then you could like take them out with a light beam and they sort of felt like an afterthought in prime two and prime three yeah they had that one that one section that was really cool i just I wish that there weren't multiple ways to take them out. You know what I mean? Like, I yeah. wish it was just like ice missiles. And I wish that it, I wish it wove into the the plot a little more. Um, the whole theme of the phase on thing, I guess, is just something I didn't find that appealing. I liked Dark Samus as a theme. The phase on just kind of felt like a weird sort of MacGuffin uh, <laughs> next to it, you know? And, um, the corruption, the corruption thing, I thought was was a smart way to try to go of getting Samus corrupted, but because she's a paragon, it's kind of hard to sell that. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. the other hunters were, the other hunters got corrupted in a way where they actually acted badly and became bad guys in Prime Three. But Samus, always as a paragon, her corruption never felt like she was going to do something bad because you were always her. 
And so that's sort of, that was difficult, I would say. And I, I think, I think that's just a hard writing problem, to be honest with you. Yeah. Well, I suppose you alleviated the issue somewhat um, with showing her face becoming more corrupted. And then I think there's a game over screen where she turns into Dark Samus. So the we're that's yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. If you die from the corruption, then you become Dark Samus. But I guess like I it's a it's a hard video game storytelling problem where you almost want to see like a fall from grace or something, you know? And or her do something that is corrupt, you know, like maybe yeah. she's passed out and blows something up or, you know, whatever, but that that never happens. So there's like a the tension is kind of hard to do because you kind of know at the end you're always going to win you're never going to become a bad guy and that's just how it's going to be why these other people become bad guys well they're not as strong or they're weaker than you you know and, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but you also yeah you never really had a touch point with the other hunters either of like after they died or after you had to take them out them being like oh but now I'm good you know or yeah. something like that it just always, it felt a little cartoonish to me, but I'm not saying that in a way where I could do it any better. It's it's a hard problem to solve. Well, writing is really hard because it's all good putting it down on paper, but then somebody's got to try and implement it in the way that the writer probably sees it in their head. So it is it is well, hard. Also with a video game, because if you're in control of the character, yeah. then how much, you know, you have to make everything almost external to the character and then it's or or have the character or lose control of the character you know and uh and i think both of those are very hard and i think one thing that's great about the great about the metroid series is that you you are always in control of samus like like we lead you down a virtuous path with her but she's never saying things well she never says things so she's never saying things that are really feel contrary to you the player playing as her. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And yeah. I, especially in Prime 1, because there's no other characters, it's just you. Uh, mm -hmm. That would be make it easier, I suppose, from a writing perspective. You have, you, you, you're not. I, I think you, so. You, yeah, you're like, you don't have to conform to certain things or cliches or anything because of another character being in it or trying to work out some dynamic between Samus and another character. Whereas Prime 1, I suppose yeah, you could just yeah, focus thought, on the world and let the world... And that's a good thing that Super Metroid does as well, is it tells the story through the world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know you know, Ridley's the bad guy because he's trying to hurt you. You know, you know he wants the baby Metroid. You know, like Super Metroid was... I love the storytelling in that because it has like five minutes of story, but it's all so meaningful. You know, like with the baby Metroid and, you know, Ridley comes, steals baby Metroid. And you do everything you can to plow through this world and then baby Metroid saves you an end. And that always feels, and then you get hyper beam and you just plow through Mother Brain and get out of there. But yet they did all that in such like a meaningful, good feeling way. But, you know, the world is the story in a lot of Metroid games, I think. And I think when you, you know... Samus is like the one character usually have like one or two big bads and then everything in between is just you trying to get enough tools to use those tools and weapons as unlockables to get from point A to point Z. Um, I feel like Prime 1 did that really well. Prime 2 is a little circumspect. Prime 3 once you got past the Galactic Federation stuff I thought it did it pretty well too. Yeah. But yeah. It's, it's very very hard. One thing um, that I love about Metroid Prime is the pacing for the most part. Like, it's pretty good. But, like, whose idea was the fetch quests? Because I've always felt that that's a bit of a pace killer, particularly on the second yeah. one. The second one is just... But the first one's not so bad. But, like, was that always an idea? How long? Do you remember how far well, those, into production? Were, uh, I, I am reasonably sure those were all... Uh japan game extension ideas especially on the first prime we were really worried the game was going to be really short and so yeah um, so it's a way of padding or extending the length of a game right because that happens quite yeah. a lot i mean they did it in zelda wind waker as well i was gonna say it's the same <laughs> pattern as zelda yeah, yeah yeah 
and then on pri- yeah so for prime one i know that came in that came in pretty late uh honestly um that was yeah that was that was very much like a japanese concern prime two i that was that was so weird it was the whole like dark visor find things to find things to find things it felt like uh, zelda wind waker you know where you're like finding the treasure maps to find the map to the treasure to find the treasure to yeah it, it was a similar it was a similar thing and i agree those are those are pace killers what i love about prime one's pacing is how long it actually takes you to get to a space pirate in prime one um that i think is really cool because you don't get to one until like aside from the intro like you get the intro and you battle a couple of space pirates that are basically on death's door, you know, then you don't get to another one until you get to Fendrana drifts, you know? And yeah. so, and that's quite far into the game. Yeah. It is, but it also means that like, you've sort of been like built, like you remember these space pirates from the beginning and you're like, these guys were kind of badasses. Then you're fighting a lot of bugs and flies and stuff for a while. But then when you get to that room in Fendrana Drifts where the space pirates jump in, it feels like a huge deal because all of a sudden combat has 100% shifted in the game and and it's thrilling. And I thought that that restraint was something that was really amazing in Prime 1 uh, on pacing. And then when you get to the mines and then you get to the uh, pirates that change depending on which beam you have, And suddenly you have this new aspect of the game of like, oh no, like my beams matter and I have to be thoughtful about how I shoot these guys. And then that kind of combat sets in and it raises that bar even more. Yeah, I thought the pacing on Prime 1 was the the hero of that game, was sort of an unsung hero of that game. Well, it's a very hard thing to get right, I feel. Pacing. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't... I honestly don't know how we did it, considering we had no pacing in the development of the project at all. And uh, it's a testament to the designers on the game. Honestly, they 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 were able to craft the flow and pacing of the game so so well. Mm. There's something I I want to get nipped in the bud because I keep getting asked this question, and I think I already know the answer, but I just want you to confirm on air. Mm-hmm. So, Craig was never considered well he was modeled but that was it right that that's as far as it went like no i mean he was there was work started on crate so the idea was they wanted to try to jam crate in there all of us said it was going to be completely impossible but there was work started on crate and when it became clear there was no way that crate was going to be finished in a way that would be acceptable or good, then uh, we took the um, uh, what uh, the elite pirate, yeah, and made it the Omega pirate, and then put a ton more work into that than anyone thought. Uh, but basically, and then everyone everyone actually thought that the that everyone was going to hate the Omega Pirate and that it was going to be the easiest boss. Turns out it's the hardest boss in the game and everyone <laughs> loves it. But yeah, basically the Kraid room became the Omega Pirate room. Uh, but Kraid had some work done on it. Uh, it was going to be, you know, a similar kraid design of him shooting platforms out of his tummy or whatever. Um, but it never got to a meaningful place in development where like we basically got almost nothing done on it when it was like determined that there was just no way it was going to make it across the finish line. Yeah. And so mainly because of time constraints, right? So if, Oh yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I suppose with the Omega part, you already had the elite part as a base to use and then you could just tweak it make it way bigger and yeah. we made it way bigger. And then we just added uh, AI behaviors on top of it. And then like, you know, a lot of it was actually built in scripting. So like a big part of the Omega pirate is that he calls in other space pirates. Right. And so that was like a real testament to our scripting system is that basically they could expose certain like AI events to the game script so that like the Omega pirate himself just goes into a mode of recharging and then the designers controlled how the other pirates came in, how they teleported in, how they teleported out, everything. So an engineer didn't do that. The engineer just basically 
did the whole like he's going into recharge state and then told the scripting system, hey, script, uh, this event, this recharge event is happening. And then the designers hook into that and they spawn all the pirates and they choose all the types of pirates and how much hit health they have and everything like that. So a lot of that encounter was basically take the elite pirate, scale them up at a few Omega specific behaviors on top of the elite pirates AI and then expose the rest to scripting so that the design the designers could tweak uh the other enemies that are spawned into that room and everything. Huh. Like yeah. do you remember the boss that was spent the most time on? The boss that was spent the most time on. Yeah. Um the Parasite Queen had a decent amount of time spent on it. Really? Um Oh, yeah. Well, the Parasite Queen had like this crazy initial design, and I'm sort of speaking for Zoid here, but um, because he implemented it where it was going to like is going to be like uh, in the room and it would like poop out eggs and then you'd have to shoot the eggs before they hatched. And then these little hatchling guys would run around and you have to take them out. And then it just got whittled down to what it is. But there was a lot of iteration on it because it was the first boss. And Mm. even though it's simple, All like the shield rotation mechanics and like all of the timings for that and everything like that were things that Japan uh, really had their hands on as well and were working back and forth a lot to get done. So that one had a decent amount of time. Ridley was a really difficult boss. Um, Ridley took a while. I imagine Uh, so. What are the other... Yeah. Yeah. So you had yeah, Ridley was great. the big bosses that I can remember is Ridley, obviously the Metroid Prime, both Phase One and Two, Thardis, which is basically Galaxy Quest. Galaxy Quest. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, who am I missing? Flagra. Um, Flagra. A lot of time was spent spent on Flagra. Like that's the thing. The bosses just all took a lot of time. Um, you know, Flagra. Uh, Flagra was a really hard one because of um, communication to the player about the mirrors, how to know when the mirrors were flipping and not, and what that really meant to Flagra. You know, um, there's there's two types of damage in the game. There's the red damage where you're actually hurting something, and then what's called yellow damage, which is stun damage. You mm. know, uh, so there's a lot of creatures where you're not actually impacting their hit points but you're stun- taking them to a stun state so that you can hurt them yeah that's and flagra right. was chock full of that like in fact the only time flagra showed damage was like during the cinemas when it was you know what a world i'm melting you know when the sun <laughs> would hit it and uh and then it would flash red to show that's what you actually did to damage flagra but before that, nothing you were doing was actually hurting the creature. It was just getting it into the position to be able to do the bomb to, you know, kill it. And so that was very hard to communicate and took like a ton of iteration and scripting of cinematic cameras and all of that. The actual like engineering work on it was less difficult than scripting everything because like Flagro was one where, you know, you it had the vines in there. It had the morph ball tunnel that you had to go to. So then you had to like do enough of the sun things to have it release the vines. Then we had to show like one of the vines being released and zoomed into a morph ball tunnel because nobody knew that those things were even morph ball tunnels. And then, you know, then you had to go in there, bomb it, and then it did its little cinematic. Then it would flip all the mirrors again. It was just a mess because it was a lot of interlocking parts that actually had nothing to do with the creature, but everything to do with all like the blockers in the world and everything. Um, Thardis, Thardis, I, I feel like had a decent amount of work on it too, and that was that was a tough one because of all of the thermal visor integration, yeah, the, the switching like, back and forth, yeah, and the blinding and like having certain things marked in there, but and then the just the animation stuff of Thardis was was interesting and different. I Ridley took a lot because Ridley was one where unlike um, unlike Flagra. Uh, it did everything. He crawled all around. He flew all around. All his bombs impacted and blew up things in the world. And Ridley was just had to be ridiculously smart and also feel like he's a creature moving in the world with you. 
Well, um, yeah, and there's such a build up to him as well. Very subtle in the way it's done, right? Because you meet him at the beginning. And then there's that little cut scene, I think, in Fendrana Drifts as well, where you see him fly over. Just Yeah, and, and then the the shadow that I'm I'm not proud of that shadow. It looks a little bad. Like Mark Pacini really wanted to have the flyover and have the shadow cast on the world. We actually didn't do projected shadows that much in the game. Uh, and so I think I I sort of hacked something in there and it it's not a proper projected shadow. Like it's not it doesn't doesn't use linear perspective quite right, which is why it kind of looks like it crawls over the environment a little. But yeah, you have that. And then Ridley, the boss himself, is I think the only boss that also has a projected shadow. Like if he's when you when you look at him on the ground, he actually has a proper shadow on the ground, not just a not just like a little puck shadow yeah. like the other enemies. Yeah. So he's a big deal. Um yeah, I, I Ridley was a very, very, very complicated boss. The the Metroid Primes were really complicated too, but they were also done like right at the end of the project. And honestly, like the engineers working on prime stages one and two were just wiped. (laughs) And so, (laughs) and there was tons of feedback and those had a giant amount of iteration. And that was, that was, um, that was bad uh, because those things are pretty complicated, but they, I, I think if they were done earlier in the project, it probably would have been a lot less of a mental nightmare for the people working on them. But yeah. Well, hey, it laid the great groundwork for the bosses in Prime 2, I feel, which upped the ante amazingly. I mean, I think the bosses in Prime 2 are probably the best in the whole series. Like, Dread might come close, but like Prime 2's bosses are just on another level, particularly because they which utilize... One? Yeah, which ones? Well, which ones I, love, like? I love Quadraxis. I think that's like... Mm-hmm. I held a... I held a uh, a little poll on Reddit to vote for people to vote on the best bosses and Quadraxis won easily. Yeah. Um, Quadraxis is great. Yeah. Yeah. The Emperor Ng is awesome. Like even creative stuff like the spider ball guardian, although people hate it because of if you die, you've got to go way back to the, the, the last save point. And um, yeah, yeah. Like the, ch- the, the Chica Amorbus, I'm probably missing some off the top of my head, but there was quite a number of vast amount of bosses as well. So, yeah, yeah. Ch- Chica and Amorbus were were I I really love Chica actually I think that one is is really cool and inventive. Amorbus uh, Amorbus was a tough one uh, because getting around that um, the arena uh, and having him still feel huge and jumping around like that was really uh, was really tough. But um, yeah, I I love the bosses in Prime Two. I mean that's like. There's a lot about Prime 2 that... Um, Sounds like just time constraints about, again. Well, no. Prime 2 was less about time constraints and more about, like, it was going to originally be, like, more multiplayer focused and less single player focused. And then then it flipped. And when it flipped, it it just got... You know, and then, like I said, you know, I'd said this in the prior one, that the Dark World was supposed to be a production saving, but then ended up being a bit of a albatross <laughs> and um and so all of that and then i think that just theming wise the whole like you're constantly taking damage unless you're in light zones and the whole ammo aspect of light and dark um japan used to talk about this a lot they used to talk about stress in games like 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 it's not about it's not about difficulty it's about stressfulness um and if something make if something's hard that's fine. But if something is stressful, then that's an issue. Mm. And so, for instance, ru- plowing ammo, like 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 beating down on a boss and then suddenly running out of ammo and needing to get out of your flow to find ammo to then get back to the boss, in my mind, it's something that's stressful. Um, you know, or like having to time all of the... Um, the dark, uh, you know, the dark bubbles um, necessarily, you know, is stressful. Like if you're sitting in one and you're like, all right, I'm about to take out a Morbus, but then I'd forgotten that five seconds prior I'd done it and it's about to go away, you know, and then in the middle of it, suddenly I'm like taking a bunch of damage. Is that difficult or is it stress? You know what I mean? Yeah, that's actually an interesting way of looking at it. 
Yeah. And so a lot of people like that. Like a lot of people love the stress. They love that that feeling. And I think it's a tender balance that, especially with the ammo stuff, we didn't quite get right in Prime 2 of like some things felt stressful in a not satisfying way that made you like, for instance, there's a lot of time in the dark world where you're just sort of plowing through it because you want to get to that next light bubble and you're not enjoying anything around you. And I think that that's, that's a difficult thing, but I think that especially like once you get the dark suit and the light suit and you're able to sort of move around a lot better, then that's when I feel like the game actually really, really opens up and becomes like, okay, this is this is the game where now it's it's strategy, it's thought, it's not like trying to remember timings and move around. And that's when I really uh, enjoyed it. Like that emperor, the emperor ring, I love. I absolutely love that boss. That's that's a great one. Yeah, it's it's when it when we talk about bosses, I'm like, yeah, they are some of the best. It's like everyone was like, okay, we learned from Prime One. Now let's let's flex. Let's <laughs> let's yeah. let's go in. Yeah. Yeah, and Prime 2 was was also, like, those light bubbles were actually a lot harder than you'd think. To, uh, to just because... make them, to make them function? No, actually, it was the lighting. So, the hardest part oh. is, like, when we're doing, most of our lighting in Metroid is static, right? And so, um, meaning that it's pre-computed, and that it's usually, like, a much lower resolution than, like, the triangle resolution, right? Right. But when you see, like, a bubble of light... What your brain expects is like a harsh edge, you know, around the bubble of light. And so we actually have that. And the way we had to do that was um, we actually had to chop up the geo where every light bubble could be so that there's a hard geometry circle edge when the light bubble is fully extended so that the light stops right there. And so we had to do all this stuff in the worlds to actually like chop them apart where light bubbles would be, static light bubbles would be placed to do that. So it's funny, like if you see light bubbles that are on platforms, you'll find that the whole platform lights up. And that's because if it's moving and everything, we're not going to chop that up. Right. But yeah. Yeah. So uh, we had some interesting problems to solve there that are things you wouldn't really even think about in the game. Since, since you're a tech guy... I'll, I'll, mm-hmm. I'll wrap up with this because I think there's a lot of unrealistic expectations when it comes to Prime 4 and people are thinking it's going to be like the Breath of the Wild moment of Metroid. And I'm, I don't see how you could possibly do an open world game and keep it at 60 frames per second with all the complicated camera work that the, the Metroid Prime series has. Like, I don't think you could do that, especially on Switch. No. I think it would be extraordinarily difficult to do that on Switch. Like even on the even on the prior um, the prior generations, the Zelda games were always games. Even before pre Breath of the Wild, you know, Wii, GameCube, all that, the Zelda games were always games that had big, expansive um, things, but they always ran at thirty, and they also always had less geometric detail close up. They always you know, like I, it, there's actually a bug in the GameCube hardware where if you had really large triangles that intersected with the, um, with the near plane, with the plane, the camera plane, and if those triangles intersected, the uh, colors would kind of uh, warble a little bit. And I remember in the Zelda games, you would see it all the time uh, because they had such giant triangles that were not, you know, geometrically detailed. Whereas on Metroid, our thing was always like our art. Like if you looked at it in wireframe. It didn't look much different from the game. And um, and we had huge amounts of geometric details. So yeah, I think that 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 seeing giant expanses, and and you could even see it in Prime Primes 2 and 3, like the areas that like the areas of Prime 2 uh that had big expanses with land didn't have nearly as much detail. You know, they had like rock faces that were kind of maybe far off or whatever. But you didn't have as much up close geometric detail as you did when you were like in caverns and stuff. So, yeah, I think they would have a. I I think if they tried to go for sixty with big open world stuff, then that would be at the expense of the high detail, cool interiors. And so I almost hope they don't go for Metroid: Breath of the Wild. I hope they go for like 
amazing, beautiful, dense geometry that still gives you that kind of claustrophobic feeling that Metroid's pretty known for, honestly. Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, it'll it'll be good. I'm sure it'll be good. I just think that some sometimes fans don't actually understand any of the technical stuff of game development, or they don't actually understand yeah. game development, period. And so they just come up with all these ideas in their head and somehow convince themselves that that's actually going to happen. <laughs> and then I it know, doesn't happen. Well, I mean, and then people get disappointed and angry. And it's like, well, you did it to yourself. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I remember when I was a kid and I thought a two-person Mario game would be like, just throw Luigi in there and both of you are on the same screen hitting the same blocks. And I remember like, I actually found it when I moved a couple of years ago. It was like an old like little design I did when I was like 12 or something of like a 2D Mario game. And I look back at it, I'm like, wow, this would have never worked. And it would have been so unfun and terrible. And it was just, you know, everyone doesn't understand it. But honestly, like, it's also the... um the role of the game people to make it so people don't really know what's going on under the hood. You know, like you don't want, you know, you go to a magic show. If you see the magician picking the wrong cards and stuff, that doesn't feel good. You don't want to know what the magician's doing. I mean, you do want to know, but then once you know, then it's like, well, that's not fun anymore. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I think it's, I think it's fine that the fans do that. And you know, I mean, we're in the age of the internet. Everyone's angry all the time. <laughs> so I don't think that's going to change. <laughs> Oh, uh, that's so true. That's so true. <laughs> yeah, but but I, 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 I do know that, like, you know, I, I miss working for Nintendo. I miss working for people that will largely make sure that if there's a vision and a need for quality, that it's going to get to that place before people see it. Um, you know, like, we got to that place on Prime 1. It was a screaming, awful crunch, but... The game still only came out when it was going to be a great game. And that's what I think Metroid Prime 4 is going to be. I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know what you tell of that story. I mean, I imagine it's going to be like Silux or whatever, but like But I don't know what it's going to be, but I know what I know they're not going to put it out and it's going to be bad. Like it's going to be good and hopefully it'll be surprising. And hopefully it'll be something that uh that injects some really good new blood into the series. I know the people that are still at retro love, love the IP and love everything about it. And everyone on there loves it. So I'm, I'm really, really optimistic as to what it's going to be. Yeah. I, honestly, I'm just really impatient and I'm hoping they use this 20th anniversary to release something. Oh, I'm not I counting want, on I it. I want to know. I'd rather be, <laughs> I'd rather have no expectations and then not be disappointed than have expectations and then be disappointed. I'm not sure if you, do you remember, there was this rumor that there was going to be a HD version of Metroid Prime, right? This has been going on for years now. Oh God. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And then there was a direct that happened and nothing got announced. And then people got super angry about it. Screw Nintendo. Yes. And I'm like, well, just some randoms just started some rumor and it somehow went viral as it did. And, th and then people yeah, get angry I, at Nintendo and retro. And it's just like... It's so funny because especially with video game rumors, like I remember it was a few months ago, someone revealed, like there was someone that had like this amazing hit rate on like guessing what was going to happen. I think it was Nintendo Directs or Sony or whatever. I think another one, yeah. And they... Yeah, and they would go back on Twitter and be like, whoa, look how much this guy got right. And I think he finally admitted that he just shotgunned a bunch of crap. And then after <laughs> the um after the the announce came out, he just deleted the old tweets that were wrong. Yeah. Well, great. And so like that's what these Nintendo Direct things are. It's like everyone gets angry. You know, it's like the old uh the old megaton announcement way back like 20 years ago when Nintendo was going to make some like megaton announcement of hardware or software and it was called megaton I, whoever named it first kudos to you because it's still a thing even though it was never anything like it never came so yeah let people be mad let them be angry yeah have no expectations the only expectation I have is that it'll be good that's it it will be good like, it will be good but, as you said Nintendo yeah. don't release anything that's bad Usually. <laughs> that we remember. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, um, 
So yeah, I think I I I am I am really really optimistic that my friends over there are going to do some uh, do some great stuff. Oh, I'm so, sure they will. And, and what better? T- yeah, what better time to make a claustrophobic game than two years during COVID when no one could leave the house? So. <laughs> Maybe that'll inform some uh, <laughs> some interesting design decisions. Uh, yeah, yeah, possibly, possibly. Well, hey, I'll uh, I'll wrap up there. Thank you so much for taking time out. Uh, I very much appreciate you doing this, as always. Um, I have a very soft spot for Prime. Um, I'll just tell you a little story. And I'm speaking to you and to all the devs. So uh, Metroid Prime was a good coping mechanism for me when my my mom passed away. I played that religiously, and rather than turning to alcohol and drugs, that was like, you know, my saving grace. So I will always hold you in high regard. Um, it makes me a bit sad oh that God. you you had to do the crunch that you did, but I just just want to say thank you, thank you so much for working on such a phenomenal game. Oh my God! I'm wow. That's really touching. I'm. I'm I'm happy to have helped you through that through that time. That's that's an awful awful time and wow, I sorry I didn't, didn't Oh, hey, no, no and I don't go around telling <sighs> this stuff, but um you know, if there's some sort of and I'm speaking to all the devs, but yeah, I mean it it got me through a tough time, so it's um that's wonderful. it's also, I'm, it's I'm, awesome to I'm, actually just to be able to speak to you, you know, and to do all this oh, stuff. Well, that's great. And I I I love doing these talks with you and honestly, they uh you 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 ask such nice questions, but also it's just so kind and welcoming and open. And I don't feel like you're trying to go for gotcha things, which I really very much appreciate. So um, I have never felt so old as it being the oh, 20th anniversary. Hey, I feel old too when just saying it, because I think I was, how old was I? I think I was 16. I can't remember my own age now, but yeah, I was 16 or so when it came out. Good Lord. Yeah, no, it's 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 such a blur. And I'm I'm honestly just happy that people are still loving and enjoying it and it's it's great and hopefully an hd remake does come out that might be what they announce on the 20th maybe maybe who knows maybe i don't know yeah i really don't know i hope god i i you know how many times have you played the game prime one i i it would be well over 50 60 times easy um same here i'm gonna play it again if they do an HD remake. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose, like, in terms of quality of life improvements, what do you add? I mean, checkpoints, maybe fine-tune the fine uh, the fetch quest, but there's not much I'd, I'd change about the game, really. It, I, it, it holds I up really to, well. Oh, yeah. I, I want them to change none of the geometry and to basically uh change the lighting model to be something more modern um you know right now it's still pretty flatly lit there's no what you know back then they had bump mapping so i would love if they could just basically add like normal maps and more um more modern lighting but keep pretty much all the same geo and you know much of the same original texture maps like i think todd todd keller did such a fantastic job on the lighting in that first game and so i'd almost just want to basically see the surfaces lit in the way that the surfaces can look now in modern times. Yeah. Yeah. And pretty much nothing else. (laughs) Uh, That's, that's, you know, that, that's what I would like to see. I mean, yes, checkpoints, more, more checkpoints for bosses. Um, You know, they'll definitely need to do that. If they do a prime two HD at some point, they'll definitely need to add in checkpoints. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah yeah but i would just like to see i would just like to see the materials um you know uh have a have a uh have a new pass on them you know use um uh use more conventional um uh, uh what's called pbr lighting models and uh and that's that's all i want to see out of it mm. honestly that and higher resolution was there ever a elevator that was considered between fendrana drifts and talon for overworld because you know how you, you go a lot, back and forth a lot between Magmore Caverns, right? Particularly when it's anything that involves Fendrana. Cause... Yeah, I doubt that there was. So the whole map was actually pretty tightly thought thought through in terms of the flow of the game. Uh, item progression and all of that. Now, I will say that the fetch quest stuff kind of break broke that a little bit. 
So I really doubt it. I think that the Magmore Caverns, uh, you definitely go back and forth through it a lot, but I also wouldn't be surprised if that was a bit of a game lengthening measure too. So yeah, I, I doubt that anyone would have reasonably put an elevator there. Because mm-hmm. again, we were full of terror that the game was too short. So, <laughs> you know. Oh, it definitely uh, wasn't short. Yeah. I mean, the 2D games are short. Like, they are short. Oh, yeah. But. Yeah, no, when when we got when we got back like near final, like that people were taking twenty to twenty five hours to beat the game, we thought it was gonna be like nine hours average, and then it turned out to be like twenty to twenty five for first playthrough. And we're like, Oh, oh, okay, this is fine, you know? So, but yeah, we're definitely worried it's gonna be a lot shorter. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jack, this has been an absolute pr- privilege to to speak to you again. I always love these chats. You're the you're you're such a sweetheart, so I love I love speaking oh, to you. Thanks. Uh, awesome. Well, I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. So that is the show, everyone. Make sure you share, like, and subscribe and play Metroid Prime again and again and again. Forever. <laughs> All right. All right. Take care, everyone. See you later.